there. Thank you once again for joining me in our study in the book of John. Today we're in chapter 16, and we're going to start in verse 16, and we're going to go down to the end of the chapter, verse 33. This is a very powerful message that Jesus is continuing to speak to his disciples as he prepares them for his death and burial and resurrection. He's, he's finished speaking to them about the Holy Spirit, and then he's just speaking to them clearly, trying to give them encouragement that they're going to go through difficult times, that there's going to be uh, a time of mourning, but uh, they're going to have joy, and that joy is going to be complete, and that peace can come upon them as they rest in Him. So let's take a look at this study and see how we can also walk in this peace that Jesus is talking about. Thank you once again for joining me in our study in the book of John. As I mentioned, we are in John chapter 6, and we're going to start at verse 16. So Jesus has been talking to us about the Holy Spirit, and he's finished talking about the Holy Spirit. So he goes on in verse 16, and he says, Jesus went on to say, A little while you'll see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. So he's speaking prophetically to the disciples and he's telling them in a little while you'll see me no more then you will see me verse 17 it goes on and says at this some of the disciples said to one another what does he mean by saying in a little while you'll see me no more and then after a little while you will see me and because i am going to the father they kept asking what does this mean a little while we don't understand what he is saying of course we understand because we know the forward story right we, we understand what, what he's talking about, that he's talking about he's going to go to the cross and he's going to leave them. And then after three days, he's going to rise up and he's going to see them again. But it really was confusing to them because here the whole world is being turned upside down, right? From, from the time uh, earlier in the evening when they were at the supper and, and he said to them that one of them is going to betray them as he's been teaching them as they've been walking towards the Garden of Gethsemane. He's been sharing many things with them. And so it's bringing a lot of confusion to them because he's kind of wrapping up all the teaching that he's been doing. And he's been speaking to them about the Holy Spirit and how this Holy Spirit's going to guide them. And, and then he says to them, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. And they're just totally confused. What does this mean? What is this little while he's talking about? Of course, we know because we know the forward story, right? Verse 19, it says, Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you'll see me no more, and then after a little while you'll see me? Very truly I tell you. Remember, whenever he uses that phrase, very truly I tell you, he's going to tell them something that's going to be hard to believe, but it's the truth, right? So verse 20, he says, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. So he's telling them there's going to be a very difficult time coming. If we remember in chapter 14, verse 1, he said to them, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me also. So he was telling them that a difficult time was coming, and if they would put their trust in him, they wouldn't go through uh, so much of a difficult time. But he knew they weren't going to do that. And so that's why he's saying to them here that there is a time coming that you're going to weep and mourn while the world rejoices. Most people are going to be rejoiced because they've killed this heretic. Most people are going to be rejoicing because Jesus is gone. But they're, they're going to be upset. They're going to be mourning. They're going to be we weeping. And they're going to be in confusion because they believe that Jesus was Messiah. They believed he was Messiah. And now all of a sudden he's gone. So where is he? What's, what's going on? What's up with this, right? So we understand that, that what he's saying here is that they're going to go through this very difficult time. But he says, but your grief will turn to joy. So this, like, oh, what does this mean? What, what is, this makes no sense, right? Of course, we understand because they were grieving because he died and he was put in the cross, in, in, in the grave. He, they were grieving because he died and was put in the grave. But we know that he rose again. And when he rose again, of course, they were rejoicing, right? There, were, there was a big celebration because here Jesus had died. They thought this was the end. They thought Messiah was gone. You know, maybe this guy isn't Messiah. I'm sure they doubted whether he even was Messiah. But then he rose again on the third day. 
and he rose rose to life so their grief was turned to joy right their 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 joy was there because Jesus had ri risen from the grave verse 21 Jesus continues to speak and he says a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come but when her baby is born she forgets the anguish because of the joy that a child is born into the world. So he was comparing what he is going to go through to the process of a woman having a child. You know, a woman goes through the labor and uh, the pain of having a child, but the moment that she she holds that child in her hand and or in her arms and suckles that child, that that all that is gone. She forgets about that because the mother's love is there for that child. And he's saying the same thing is going to happen here. That there's going to be pain that you're going to go through. There's going to be anguish that you're going to go through. But joy is going to come. Joy is going to come. Verse 22. So with you, now is your time of grief. But I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. This, this is an amazing thing, right? Because here he's telling them what's going to happen. And, and it was a prophetic word that became true. He, he says, you're, you're in grief now because they were all in confusion, right? Jesus told them he was going to be betrayed. He told them he was going to die. They didn't understand what it was all about. And the, they were in anguish already because of the things he was saying to them. And so he's saying to them, you know, you have your grief now, but... There will come a time of rejoicing. You will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. No one will be able to take away your joy because you'll have seen me raised from the dead. You'll know. And it doesn't matter what you go through after this, that your joy will be there. Your joy will be complete, right? That That's what happens when we have Jesus in us. When we take Jesus in us, there is a joy. There may be grief we go through. There may be difficulties we go through. But when we understand that we are a child of the King, when we understand that this world is not our home, that we are just passing through, we are just strangers passing through, we have a home that we are going to, that that joy is, is, is still in us, that it's a joy beyond what we can understand. You know, when we lose a loved one, it, it's difficult, right? It, it's hard when we lose someone who's close to us and, and there's grief that we have to work through. But if we have the Lord in us, that that grief is, is shortened tremendously because he works that through us and he brings that joy back to the top again, right? The joy of being who we are. When we know who we are, that we are a child of God, that we have been, we have been adopted into a family and that that we one day will be in a place where there will be no more tears, there will be no more death, and we will just be rejoicing. And that joy is in us. And you can't take that joy away. Uh, you know, Paul was such a great example of this, right? He, he says, you know, the, the trials and tribulations, they were, they were nothing. And I counted them for joy. I mean, when you go through the list of trials and tribulations that Paul went through, they were not nothing. He was stoned, left for dead. He was whipped. He was put in prison. There's so many things. He was shipwrecked. So many things happened to him. And he just said, oh, they were just a light affliction compared to the joy that I have in serving the Lord. And that's the attitude we need to have, right? The, the joy we have in serving the Lord in us is so much greater than that of this world, right? Verse 23, he goes on to say, In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. So he's just saying to him, in that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will be there given revelation, right? The Holy Spirit is in us. That's what he's been talking about. The Holy Spirit will be there giving us revelation. And we will know, know all things, right? We will know the things that we need to know. And He will, the Father will give us whatever we ask in his name. Now, I know a lot of people have used this verse and, and verses like this to say that we can ask for anything and God will give it to us. Well, that's not the truth because God's not in, in, interested in material things. He will give us the things we need to fulfill the things that he has asked us to do, that he wants to do through us. He's not going to give us uh, a great big fancy Mercedes or a mansion or or, or whatever. He may give you the opportunity to make money. He may give you an opportunity to do something where you're able to buy those things. But the, the most things that he does is he provides for us 
the things that we need to fulfill the calling that he has on our life. You know, I, I've talked to many, many people who who struggle with material things because they they want to do something for God and they don't have the resources. And so they're, they're always asking people to, to give and give and give. And <laughs> a bit of an issue with the guy here lately. He wanted me to preach at a at an event he was going to have in, in, I won't even mention the country. And so we went along about uh, organizing the, the situation and we all had the dates all nailed down and everything. And then he says, well, now you have to send me this much money so we can have this thing. And I said, so you want me to come and you want me to preach at this thing and, and then you want me to pay for the whole event too. Like, <laughs> you know, I'm a missionary in Africa. I have... I have orphan children that I have to look after, I have a church, I have discipleship school, I have everything that we are doing there that the resources that God gives us, that's what we put them into. I said, so I'm willing to teach at your event, but it's not up to me to pay for your event. If you want to have an event, you pay for the event, I will come and teach at it. Verse 24, he goes on and he says, until now you have not asked for anything in my name, ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. When we ask the Lord for something that helps us to complete the mission that he sent for us, there's a joy that comes complete. He's, he's also talking, I believe, about revelation, asking about the word of God, asking about the things of God, asking the Holy Spirit to give us revelations that we will receive that. Our joy is not complete in material things. Our joy is complete in relationship with Jesus. Our joy is complete when we are walking with the Father, when we know that we can come into the presence of the Father, that we become the righteousness of Jesus and we have a right to come into the presence of God. As he says in, in John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus has opened a way for us to come to the Father, to come in relationship with the Father, that we can walk with him and be with him. Verse 25, he goes on, he says, Though I am speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I have come from God. So he's saying that, you won't have to ask me to ask the Father. You can speak to the Father himself because the Father loves you. Because you have believed me. You have believed that I have come from God. Remember what Jesus said in John 6 and 29 when the people asked him, what is the work of God? He says, the work of God is this, that you believe in the one that he has sent. This is such a powerful word. This is such a powerful message. And I know I've said it, spoke about it many times before, but we, we need to get this home, right? Believing in Jesus opens up a huge doorway for us, opens up something beyond what we can even imagine, that it is absolutely life-changing. It is unbelief that destroys us. It is unbelief that takes away all the joy that we receive when we come to Jesus. So it's very important for us, and this is what he's saying here. He says, no, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I have come from God. When we believe that Jesus has come from God, when we believe that he is the Messiah sent from God, that he is the Savior of the world, when we believe that Jesus is all who he says that he is, when we believe and we walk by faith, we take that knowledge and apply faith, then we are set free in a whole new way, right? We are set free in a whole new way. And Jesus says here that the Father loves us because we have accepted him and have accepted him as the one that has come from God. And that is so important for us. That's, that's what brings our life new. That's what, that's what turns things right around, right? I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. So he talked to them plainly, right? I came from the Father. I entered the world. Now I am going back to the Father. I'm leaving this world and I'm going back to the Father. Verse 29 says, Then Jesus, then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and you, you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you have come from God. Verse 31 
Do you now believe, Jesus replied, a time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone. My Father is with me. So he's saying to him, do you finally believe? Do you finally understand? But he, he, he's kind of telling them, you know, you say you understand, but there's, there's, you're, there's a big trial coming yet. Yeah? There's still a big trial coming. You know, they went through these difficulties because they still didn't have the Holy Spirit with them, right? The Holy Spirit was not in them. The Holy Spirit was not with them. And so that's what the di difficulty is, right? So here he's saying to them, you believe. Well, the time is coming when you will be scattered, each to your own home. And he's talking about when, when he's arrested, right? When he's taken into captivity before he goes to the cross. Each goes to his own home. Everybody leaves him alone. He says, yep, yep, my father is with me. The father will always be with me. I will not be alone. Verse 33 he goes on, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Here's a very powerful verse for us, right? And he's closing off this chapter and he says, I have told you these things so that in me you will have peace. If, you are, if we abide in Jesus, we will have peace. If we abide in him, the peace is upon us. The peace of God is in us. In the world, you will have trouble. The world will cause you nothing but trouble. There's anguish in the world. Like, look around us now. Look at the difficulties that, that are in this world today. But take heart, he says, I have overcome the world. When we come into Jesus, when we become part of this family, we can have peace in the midst of confusion. We can have peace in the midst of the calamity that's around us. We can have peace in the midst of the evil that is beset against us, in the trials and tribulations we go through, because he has overcome the world. Even though the world has not understood that he has overcome them, he has, in fact, overcome them, and we can have peace. Even if the world takes our life, the only thing they can do is kill our body. They cannot take eternal life away from us, because when we have accepted Jesus into our life, we are already an eternal being, and our eternal life has already started. So we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear but death itself, right? Death is nothing that we have to worry about. Death, death comes to all of us. We're all going to go through that experience. And, and on the other side of that curtain that we step through when we die is going to be an amazing thing. It's going to be an amazing thing for us to, to live through. And so he's encouraging the disciples. I told you these things so that you may have peace. You know, you're going to go through these difficult times. There's going to be difficult times coming, but there's a Holy Spirit. There's a comforter that's going to lead you and guide you. He's going to come, right? And in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome this world. And they did. Every one of them went through difficult times. They went through horrendous times of persecution because of the message that they were sharing, because of the message of Jesus that they were speaking. They went through horrible times, and yet they still had a peace. They had a peace because... They rested in Jesus, and that's what each and every one of us have to do as well, right? We have to put our trust in Jesus, and because he says, I have overcome the world, right? He has overcome the world, so he's given us peace. Thank you for joining me today in this chapter. Um, let us pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are, you are speaking to your disciples and you're speaking to us. Father, we just thank you for this peace that we can have, Lord, that is with us today. You have overcome the world. Even the world tries to give us trouble. We have peace because you are with us. You are in us. And we just thank you for that. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If this is the first one of these uh, sessions that you've seen. We've done many sessions, and you can access them by going to our YouTube channel listed below or onto our website, also listed below. I look forward to seeing you next time. May the Lord bless you. Remember, walk in his peace because he has made it possible for us to do that. Amen. Okay, girls. Take a